Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies and show you how they were made. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Red Dragon, released in 2002. Red Dragon is an adaptation of Thomas Harris's novel of the same name, the same source material for Manhunter, which I covered a few weeks ago. Like the 2017 It, though, I wouldn't call this a remake, but rather a different adaptation of the same book. Though 2001's Hannibal was nowhere near the critical darling that Silence of the Lambs was, it was still a commercial success, meaning there was still money to be made from the character. Producer Dino De Laurentiis, who had been disappointed by Manhunter's reception, decided to adapt the OG Hannibal book again, but this time with more feeling. And by feeling, I mean Anthony Hopkins. Sorry, Brian Cox. Fuck off. And so we once again follow Will Graham as he teams up with Hannibal Lecter to hunt the killer known as the Tooth Fairy. Since it uses the same source material, Red Dragon has a lot of the same scenes and dialogue as Manhunter. That makes it difficult for me to judge on its own merits, kinda like when a remake doesn't add anything new. For most of this movie, I've seen it before, and I can't tell if my boredom just comes from familiarity. It doesn't help that I'm a huge Manhunter fan. A fan hunter? So I'm comparing it to that film the whole way through. In fact, I'd like to get those comparisons out of the way in this intro, so I don't spend the whole video talking about how each scene is the same or different. I'm sure I'll still do that plenty though. First off, the good, since it's a shorter list. Ray Fiennes plays the Tooth Fairy this time around, and we get to spend more time with the character. I don't prefer Fiennes over Tom Noonan, but he's just as good as the villain. No surprise, since dude was at the start of his reign as Voldemort. Also, Freddie Lyons is played by Philip Seymour Hoffman, and while Stephen Lang is excellent, Hoffman was one of the best actors of his generation. I love that the opening scene shows us Hannibal pre-incarceration, and that the ending is a little closer to the book. Manhunter's janky finale was always its weakest part. But that's about all I can say in favor of Red Dragon. Will Graham is played by Edward Norton here, who I really like. I mean, the guy was smoochy. But I can't not see him as Ed Norton, and I definitely cannot see him as Will Graham. William Peterson felt like a man truly broken under the weight of his superhuman gift to understand serial killers. It was a haunting somber performance. Ed Norton just seems sad. And when it comes to Lecter, we all know Hopkins was great in silence, but the character continues its flanderization that began with Hannibal. He's sneering all over the place, and senselessly using that southern accent he used to pointedly mock Clarice Starling. You know, I believe we're making progress. Why would you use that with Will Graham? The performance matches the style, or lack thereof, of director Brett Ratner, who does nothing interesting here. And I'm not just saying that because he's a creep who fled the country after his career tanked in the wake of various sexual misconduct allegations. What if you showed up and I was absolutely crazy and I said, Naked. I want you naked <laughs> in all your scenes. Red Dragon is the least subtle of the Hannibal films up to this point. You can tell just by the sound effects <laughs> and music cues. Don't get me wrong, Ridley Scott's Hannibal had occasional weird shit. But Red Dragon is just constantly in your face. Have you never felt a sudden rush of panic? <laughs> Literally. I know a lot of people love this movie, and that's okay. It's got some good stuff, including a recognizable cast. But for me, it's a continuation of this franchise's gradually declining quality. But hey, at least it's better than Hannibal Rising. Will we get the same kills as... Sorry. Hello? Hello, Jamothy. I bet you've been wondering when I would call. Zoran? No, I, I don't have anything I need your help with this week. Sorry to disappoint you, James, but I'm afraid Zoran has been... Rebooted. Puppet James, what do you want? Oh, only to help. After all, I know everything weighing on your mind. Like all those pesky subscriptions you keep wasting hours on the phone trying to cancel. I could take care of that for you. I just need some personal information. Well, you're right. Those subscriptions are annoying. But I have today's sponsor, Rocket Money. Come again? Rocket Money is the personal finance app that lets you cancel subscriptions, lower your bills, and generally manage your money better. James, 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 what can an app offer that your own puppet self can't? Well, besides the fact that I'm pretty sure this is some kind of ploy to assume my identity, Rocket Money is great at safely and securely identifying recurring charges. Just tracking subscriptions? Please, we both know where the real time suck lies in the calls. That's true. That's why Rocket Money allows me to cancel unwanted subscriptions within the app through just a couple of taps. No customer service or creepy doll calls required. You may have won this round, human James, but I'll be back. Uh, hello? In fact, Rocket Money has helped save its customers up to $740 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. You can take control of your finances, doll sell free, and join the more than 5 million members using Rocket Money today. Go to rocketmoney.com slash kill count to get started for free. Will we get the same kills as Manhunter when we do that same story again? Let's find out and get to them. 
The movie begins in 1980, 10 years before the events of The Silence of the Lambs. Hannibal Lecter's attempts to enjoy an orchestra are being routed by a faulty flautist. Ah, pity. He's gonna have to eat that problem up. The musician goes missing, and during a dinner party, we see Hannibal's guests dining on a mystery meal. It's later confirmed to be musical meat in opening credits headlines. This scene is fun to open the movie with, since the incident was actually mentioned by Clarice and Hannibal. In the case of the flute, it's Benjamin Raspail. He did it to improve the sound of the Baltimore Philharmonic Orchestra, serving the not-so-talented flute player sweetbreads to the board with a nice montrachet at $700 a bottle. As bad as these movies get, the shared universe of their source material feels rich and lived in, even when characters get recast in between films or don't quite fit what we know about them. Benjamin Raspal was the flautist? I thought he was the head in the jar guy who got Buffalo killed. Hannibal's sporting a ponytail. Not the most effective de-aging approach, but it's forgivable. This was before Saw perfected the backwards hat technique. And as far as I can tell, this was Hopkins's real hair. Was he just like really on vacation before this shoot? At this point in time, Hannibal is working with Detective Will Graham, an FBI agent who consults the psychiatrist to track down serial killers. Again, it's good to see this in action rather than just hear about it in a grocery store. Graham's inquiring about a killer who eats body parts known as the Chesapeake Ripper. We see that name in those headlines, and as far as I can tell, this is the first appearance of it. It's not even in Thomas Harris's novels. It would become a part of the Brian Fuller series on NBC, as would these homoerotic undertones. Oh, I'd love to get you on my couch. Since he senses Will is getting close, Hannibal excuses himself from the room. Graham takes a measured look at his library, only to discover the Canimic classic to serve man. Too bad Willy Boy's a real slow reader. He takes so many push-ins that Hannibal shanks him in the side. The doctor tells him not to be sad that it's over, but happy that it happened. I regret it came to this wall, but every game must have its ending. Before he can deliver a final serving with his knife, Will makes Hannibal quiver with the Nighthawk special and shoots the absolute hell out of him. Damn, man, don't kill that guy. We need him for the rest of the movie. The aforementioned opening credits feature a foreshadowy scrapbook that gives a condensed version of what happened next. Will went to a hospital and a psych ward, and Hannibal went to jail. We also get hints of the Tooth Fairy's grandma-centric backstory, like her nasty teeth and naughty spanky time. After that, we're in Marathon, Florida in 1987, if we're going by Jelensky math. Will is enjoying retirement with his wife Molly and their son Josh. Wait, Josh? Didn't that kid's name used to be Kevin? Kevin, why don't you run down to the water to check out the dock? I wanna hang around here. Yeah, I thought so. Who the fuck is Josh? I mean, neither name was in the book Red Dragon, where the kid was a stepson named Willie! Graham's visited by Jack Crawford, the head of the FBI's behavioral science unit, played by Harvey Keitel this go-around, who we just saw in From Dusk Till Dawn. Crawford's investigating a serial killer named the Tooth Fairy who's already murdered two families. Now he's here, dogging his reservoir of experts for help. Will is reluctant, both for his sake and Molly's, but agrees to take a look at one of the crime scenes in Atlanta. He wades through this jacked-up pollock of a house, where broken mirrors belie broken families. To make this crime scene look real in terms of blood amount and location, production consulted with forensic technical advisors and FBI profilers. These are dead people, right? Yeah, uh, not necessarily. Later, Graham finds some home videos. Wait, pool party? Glad that ain't a 16 millimeter reel. Nah, it's just Mr. and Mrs. Leeds being horny for each other. You know, I think maybe we're gonna put these kids to bed a little early tonight. Nice. Since we see the whole family in this Deeds of the Leeds home video, I'll follow Manhunter rules and put them all on the count. There are two factors here, actually. Seeing them in video form and seeing the bloody aftermath of their murders on the walls, which we don't get with the Jacobis. And if that's not good enough for you, we also see flashes of the Leeds later with mirrors in their eyes. It's really disgusting and eerie thanks to makeup effects artist Matthew Mungle. He created the fake glass pieces worn over their eyes and a slit neck appliance for Mr. Leeds. The grisly work takes a toll on the family man, who chokes up talking about the children but he's able to get into the mindset of the killer. Maybe since that broken mirror distorts his face and almost gives him Francis Dollarhide's cleft palate. Nice touch there. In any case, he figures out that they can get a fingerprint. You took your gloves off, didn't you, you son of a bitch? As in previous depictions, Will Graham is basically psychic, using the power of imagination to suss out murderous intent. Mrs. Leeds and Mrs. Jacoby were the primary targets. The others were killed just to complete his fantasy. His instincts lead to a fingerprint on an eyeball, but it's not enough, so Crawford pressures him to get help with the case from his old consultant. Never mind that he tried to kill him. Graham heads to the sanitarium where Lecter is held, run by Dr. Chilton. He's once again played to smarmy perfection by Anthony Heald, reprising the role from Silence of the Lambs. Chilton is more obsequious here, though. Maybe since he hasn't had the job for as long. Or maybe since Graham isn't a small woman he can harass. Will makes his way through the dungeon to find Hannibal, who takes this meeting lying down. It's a start 
stark contrast to how he greeted Clarice Starling. With Will, Hannibal's familiar, like the two are old chums. That's the same atrocious aftershave you wore in court. Will tells the good doctor he needs help figuring out how the tooth fairy chooses his victims. They both play chicken for a minute before Lecter agrees to look at the case file. Hell yeah, the boys are back, baby! Just like old times, eh, Will? Just like old times indeed. Red Dragon saw the return of Silence of the Lambs screenwriter Ted Talley, whose script convinced others to return to the series after they found Hannibal too gross. That included production designer Christy Zia, who built this dungeon set based on her original designs, which had been donated to a museum. They were able to dress it with some original props, while others had to be recreated. Zia also decorated Hannibal's home in the opening scene based on pictures of where Sigmund Freud lived. Will visits the crime scene of the Jacoby family in Birmingham, Alabama. In the backyard, he's tabbed off that the killer went high and observed the family from a tree branch. He finds a carved-in calling card, a mahjong symbol for the red dragon, which he later shows Hannibal while he's getting exercise on the handy-go-round. This walk and talk was one of several scenes featuring Hannibal that wasn't in Thomas Harris's book. Screenwriter Tally felt that Lecter needed more screen time due to the character's popularity, which Harris acknowledged as a commercial reality. The author helped by emailing and faxing ideas for scenes and dialogue. Hannibal, being a man of culture, points Graham Cracker in the direction of painter William Blake. With the help of some library books and a young worker, who is definitely hot for him, Will finds what he's looking for. The Great Red Dragon and the Woman Clothed with Sun, a real-life illustration by Blake from 1805. That same painting is hung inside the Tooth Fairy's Dragon Den, which also houses the John Doe Journal from the opening credits. Looks like our serial scrapbooker has been following Will's investigation, and fanboying over his favorite cannibal. In private, the Tooth Fairy is a weightlifting, denture-wearing ball of rage, who's haunted by the disembodied voice of his deceased abusive grandma. If you ever make your bed dirty again, and I'll cut it off. Yeah, she threatened to cut off his penis. No wonder the guy's messed up. That VO was a bit of a cameo, by the way, from Ellen Burstyn, best known from The Exorcist, which we'll be looking at in just two weeks. In public, the Tooth Fairy goes by Francis Dollarhide, a mild-mannered technician at a St. Louis film lab. In addition to his granny gripes, Dollarhide's angst stems from his cleft palate, which is why he smashes the mirrors in his victims' homes. He develops a crush on his blind co-worker Reba, since she can't see his facial scar. She returns the interest, since he knows how to talk his way into a woman heart. I have no pity. Reba is played by British actress Emily Watson, not to be confused with Rafe Fine's Harry Potter co-star Emma Watson. Emily Watson does an excellent job. It's one of my favorite performances of the film. Francis offers Reba a ride home in the rain, and the two bond over shared life experiences. She can hear that he's had some kind of surgery on his lip, but tells him not to be ashamed. If you don't want to talk to me, that's cool. But I hope that you will, because... I know what it's like to have people always thinking that you're different. Their romance is on a slower track than it was in Manhunter, though. This first date is cut short when she asks to touch his face, causing him to abruptly leave. Back in Balmore, some bum fodder correspondence from the Tooth Fairy is found in Lecter's cell. It's discovered by a faceless Run Simmons in a cameo, he of Run DMC. I don't know what Ratner's backstory with musicians is, but boy was I surprised to see that Michael freaking Jackson visited the set. Sit still or he'll hear us. Who will? Michael Jackson. He's upstairs. <laughs> he also seemed to be chummy with Sean Combs on the red carpet. After is having a private party at the Hudson. Yeah. Oh, that is not a party I want to be at. The police are forced to do a speedy forensics job on the letter, trying to keep Hannibal in the dark, figuratively and literally. It's scanned by document technician Lloyd Bowman, played by Ken Leong, who was previously on the Kill Count and Saw. Bowman's better at spotting handwriting than tripwires, and they're able to deduce that Lecter's response will be published in the Tattler. That's the Chicago tabloid that's been covering the Tooth Fairy case. We saw some of its headlines and articles in the opening credits, including pictures of Will Graham in the hospital, which were taken without his consent by sleazy reporter Freddie Lowndes. The note is returned to Lecter's cell and his response is intercepted, but it's anything but straightforward. I offer 100 prayers for your safety. Find help in John 622-816-91, Luke 17. God. Has to be. Will lets the message run to avoid severing a direct line to their suspect, a decision he comes to regret once Bowman deciphers the code later that night. It says, Graham Home, Marathon, Florida. Save yourself, kill them all. Molly and Ke er, Josh are evacuated to a safe house, where Will teaches his wife how to fend off tooth fairies and rival weed dealers. With Dollarhide still on the loose, the FBI decides to work with Freddie Lowndes, paying him a visit at the U.S. Department of Tattling. Will gives him an unflattering expose on the tooth fairy. We do also speculate that he's the product of an incestuous home. Mm -hmm. 
No wonder the creep's such a loser, right? <laughs> They're hoping to draw the Tooth Fairy out by goading him into attacking Will, but instead, after he sees the article, Dollarhide kidnaps Lowndes on his way to work. The reporter wakes up in a wheelchair, glued down like a Saw sequel skinhead. He quickly realizes who his captor is, and is too terrified to even look at him. Open your eyes and look at me. No. If you won't open them yourself, I'll staple your eyelids to your forehead. <laughs> When he finally does, Dollar Hyde removes his Depop kimono, revealing an ass so fine it'll make you say, Oh my, dear God, Jesus. Holy Jesus, jumping Christmas shit! Dollar Hyde is also rocking an elaborate Red Dragon back tattoo. He's fit to be dyed. Is he fit to have you? This detail was left out of Manhunter, maybe because it took eight hours to apply. It was designed by tattoo artist Tom Berg and applied by a team of people headed by makeup artist Ken Diaz. Diaz also designed Okoye's head tattoo in Black Panther and some of the coolest prosthetics in the thing. Dollarhide gives a PowerPoint presentation on his recent escapades, which he thinks is transforming him into a powerful beast. He recites some of my favorite dialogue from Manhunter. Mrs. Leeds in human form. Do you see? Yes. This is Jacoby changing. Oh my Do you god. See? And in fact, this ends up being one of my favorite scenes in Red Dragon, mostly because of the two actors involved. Dollarhide forces Lowndes to recant his article on tape, then bites the guy's lips clean off. The next morning, a security guard is treated to some breaking news. Freddy Lowndes is dead, and his corpse is catching fire as it crashes in front of the Tadler's offices. This is one of those scenes that's awesome in both Red Dragon adaptations. We all know how fire stunts are done by now, but I still love to acknowledge the people who actually do them. Kia Johnston, in this case, who wore the usual protection and was guided by stunt coordinator Conrad Palmisano. They put him in multiple layers of fire-resistant gear slathered in a fire gel. Oh, and a nightmare-inducing mask, of course. This one designed by Matt Mungle. Johnston had to breathe through a hose while riding a wheelchair down a steep street. The chair was on wires to make sure it went the right way, which were later removed in post with simple VFX. Awesome fire stunt. Great job, everybody! Crawford's team listens to Lowndes' tape, which includes an explicit threat leveled at Will. He knows you made me lie. Will Graham, because I was forced to lie, he will be more merciful to me than to you. Will once again seeks out his cannibal consultant, who dances around the identity of his death-peddling pen pal. Still, just like in silence, he's willing to help if certain arrangements are made. What kind of arrangements? Oh, nothing much. Shall we say, dinner and a show? Dollarhide takes a break from his serial-killing side hustle to continue courting Reba. He takes her to visit some zoo veterinarian clients of his, who let her pet a sedated tiger. For me, this scene doesn't hit as hard as the one in Manhunter. The lighting and the way it's shot made me question whether that tiger was really there, until I saw in behind-the-scenes stuff that it definitely really was. I do like that the moment is given more context, though. Earlier, Reba told a story about seeing a cougar before she lost her eyesight. It's a sweet gesture from Francis, even if it gets confusing for some people when she very pointedly grabs the tiger's junk. But that's a detail from the book, and it shows how forward Reba is when it comes to sexuality. She's taken to Dollar Hyde's den, where she uses a clock chime to establish the layout. While her spatial awareness is great, she still can't see this red dragon's red flags, like the dirty dentures in the bathroom or the stolen home videos playing on his TV. What's that about? Some people I'm going to meet. Reba tells Francis that the ladies they work with all talk about how hot he is. Cleft palate or not, I totally buy it. And I feel like that was the case in Manhunter too. Tell me this chick ain't thirsty for the noons. Reba gets so hot and horny, she treats Francis like that tiger. They go to bed together, but the next morning, his relative bliss is disrupted since he hears voices in his head. They tell him things that he will do, they show him things that he'll do too. They talk to him. But finds his dollar hide is slightly more sympathetic than Noonan's, since we see him fighting those urges. No, she, she's nice. She, she's okay. Finds avoided watching Manhunter and focused on the novel for his acting inspiration. Dollarhide visits the Brooklyn Museum, hoping to cut the Red Dragon's power off at the source. He goes under the guise of writing an academic thesis, which gains him access to Blake's original illustration. As soon as he's up close and personal, he subdues his supervisor and stuffs the whole painting in his mouth? Are you serious, dude? That paint can't be healthy for you, man! But Francis is desperate to curb his inner dragon's appetite, and I guess get some extra fiber in. It'll keep you regular. Back in Baltimore, Dr. Lecter is enjoying a fancy dinner his reward for giving Graham a cracker crumb of a hint. To see them living, he said, right in front of you. It's something about these home movies. Lecter keeps saying, 
you looked but didn't see. As Will views one of the leads' as home videos, he deduces the Tooth Fairy must have known the interior of their house. After a phone call with the Jacoby family's lawyer, Will finds out they had a similar video made by the same company, Chromalux. Graham and Crawford fly to their headquarters in St. Louis and find out their likely suspect is Francis Dollarhide. As they get his home address, the Tooth Fairy himself arrives, and since he recognizes Will from the papers, he flees. Run away! He seeks solace with Reba, only to see that she's been spending time with a co-worker named Ralph, who had flirted with her earlier. Reba's not interested in Ralph, but a quick peck on the cheek is all it takes to get this jealous dragon seeing red. Dollar Eye lays his vengeance upon Ralph with a quick and simple a headshot. Then he knocks on Reba's door and knocks her out with chloroform. Dollar Hyde suspects Reba sold him out to the feds, so he sets his home ablaze and prepares to kill her in a murder-suicide. But he loves her too much to go through with it. Instead of getting shot, Reba hears a gun go off and gets blood splatter on her face. She falls to the floor and feels on some bloody brow, convincing her that Dollar Hyde is dead. I mean, to be fair, she can't see that there's no kill graphic. The chiming of the clock helps guide the sightless Cinderella out of the burning building. She gets outside just as the cops arrive, and though Will tries to get inside, those plans go up in flames, seemingly closing the case on the Tooth Fairy. This massive fire stunt was done with the set they built on a universal soundstage. It's wild that they did this inside a soundstage, and even wilder how flippant Ratner seems about his actors. But they're not gonna be able to take the heat any longer than that. That's what'll help the scene, I think. <laughs> sure enough, looks like it got too hot for them during takes. Better if you go with me. They also blew up the exterior set they built for the Dollar Hide house, but even though it was a real explosion, which you know I always love, they added visual effects in post that I think kind of cheapens it. Reba recovers in the hospital, where Will says it's not her fault that Dollar Hide became obsessed with her. You didn't draw a freak, okay? You drew a man with a freak on his back. Oh. Oh, shit, are you, are you talking to me? Hey, don't mock my drawing. I'm not the only bad artist here. With the Tooth Fairy dead, Will and his family return to their home in Florida. But it isn't long before Will gets an unfortunate call. The faceless corpse that Reba felt didn't belong to Dollar Hide. DNA results, which may be anachronistic, depending on what year this takes place, reveal that the burnt-up body was Ralph's, meaning Dollar Hide is still at large. The killer's already bashing some bad luck into Will's life. The agent finds G.I. Dragon upstairs with his son, who's really been a non-factor this whole movie. <laughs> Fucking Josh. Since Will studied Dollar Hyde's diary, he decides to stir up some bad granny memories. Look at you. I've never seen a child as disgusting as you. The ploy works and Dollar Hyde attacks, giving Will the opening to run and hide with his son in another room. Molly arrives to check on them and just barely avoids the crossfire as the two men turn on their wall hacks. They both get shot, but Will only gets a kill assist, since it's Molly who ultimately guns down the killer, putting that earlier firearm training to good use. Hannibal pens the recovering Will a letter, which he reads as he's out sailing with his family. Chilton informs Lecter that he has a special visitor. A young woman. Says she's from the FBI. And the movie ends just as the Silence of the Lambs begins. How many victims did this red dragon slay? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Is there something in my teeth? How long's that been there? God damn it! I counted nine kills in Red Dragon, which is actually one fewer than there was in Manhunter. There were six male victims and three female victims, giving us a two to one ratio of dudes. This count and gender breakdown has been seen in three other kill counts before, including Chopping Mall, which is awesome. With a runtime of 125 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 13.89 minutes. I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to Freddy Lowndes. It's the most disturbing and memorable sequence in the movie, with an even more impressive fire stunt than we got in Manhunter. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to the flautist from the opening. His off-screen kill fell a little flat. And that's it! Red Dragon came out in 2002 and broke the record for best October movie opening. It was the last time Hopkins ever played Hannibal, but we're not quite done with the character yet, unfortunately. Until next week, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. Let's say you own the rights to a popular horror character, but you've already adapted all the books about him into movies. <laughs> There's only one thing to do. What's that? Force the author to rush out a crappy prequel novel that you can turn into a crappy prequel film. It's monstrous. Hannibal Rising gives us a Hannibal backstory we never asked for, and turns him into the hero of the story. Oh. Oh, that's easy. Just add Nazis! <laughs> we watch as a young Hannibal has his first brush with cannibalism. Wait. Or die. Then he grows up into an annoying edgelord who has the hots for his aunt. Don't fool with me. I'm not! She's a step aunt, if that makes it any better. And she's hot for him, too. At least until he starts his people eating. Do you suppose God intended to eat Isaac? 
Incredible Rising features forced references to the earlier, better films. What he is now, there's no word for it. Even have a thing with a mask? Are, are you fucking kidding me? Come on! I will never apologize to you. Worse are the boring villains and the constant repetition of names. Hannibal. Misha. Hannibal. Misha. Hannibal. Rocky. Oh, sorry. That last one was from a better movie. You tricked me. But hey, might as well experience this train wreck for yourself. So this week, watch Kid Hannibal kill people with a samurai sword. I'm not even joking. But on Friday, tune in for The Kill Count. Where? Only on Dead Meat. Let's begin. Hannibal Rising. You can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Dead Meat always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before it's Kill Count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill Counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching The Kill Count for Red Dragon. I know that a lot of people really like this movie, maybe because when you saw it, or maybe you just really like it in general. I remember seeing it in theaters when it came out when I was a kid. Uh, that's, you know, how early I was into horror movies. I didn't really remember anything about it until I rewatched it now, and just, it's it's impossible for me to really love it after watching Manhunter. I do love this drawing I did, though. This is a this is a custom James original. Uh, this is a, the stupidest idea for a joke uh, maybe I've ever had, but we did it. And, oh wait, never mind. We had the whole corn pussy pit last week. Anyway, I realized after doing this that a lot of you probably don't even know uh, who Freakazoid is. That's okay. It's, it's a okay joke if you know who he is. I want to thank some patrons like Matt Trent, Nicole Carbajal, Vicky, Frazier 300, and Jesse Maha. I was actually kind of struggling with that to the numbers bit. The red pepper flake would not stay on my teeth. If only I had had eight hours to have someone draw the red dragon tattoo on my back. Thanks everyone. Be good people.